final projects thing with the web page. There's a month to go, and this should be a, like a two-week kind of a final project. The idea is not to um, the idea is not to have you working all quarter for it, which is part of the reason I've been stalling. So, so the way the rest of the course goes is there'll be one more assignment after. All right. This is assignment seven. That's oh, I'm sorry. Assignment seven is due week from Thursday, right? And then there'll be one more assignment after that. Assignment seven's up on the web. And assignment eight will, well, let's see, I have to think some about that. And then the final project, I came up with some possibilities, but basically the idea is come up with a patch and, a, and be prepared to come show your patch to the class. Um, the patch could be one of a bunch of different things. And ideas that I had were, um, I'm not sure this first one is a real good idea, but um, make, a, make a thing that actually is a patch where you hit start and it plays a piece of music using synthesis techniques that you've learned. Um, I have to teach you one technique in order to make that possible, which is how to sequence. Uh, I've, I've shown you how to do looping sequencers, but I haven't shown you the more general sequencing techniques in PD. So that will be one thing that I shoehorn in at some point in maybe in the next week. I'm not sure. Uh, the the next one is kind of the obvious one. Make a nice 4-4 drum machine slash sequencer. And I went and dug one up just to entertain you with. This is good. This isn't real syllabus stuff anyway, so I can be doing this now. Um, here's me making a here's me making a drum sequencer. This uses all sorts of synthesis techniques you don't know. So yours won't sound like this. Um, notice that it doesn't do the same thing every time through. And the interesting thing, the thing that's fun about making these things is figuring out when to throw what with what probability in order to make this sort of thing happen. Because you can make these very, you can make these lane very easily. In fact, you might think this is lame, so and no comment. That was actually me trying to design a synthesis technique, and the synthesis technique didn't go very far, but the drum machine sounded cool, so I just sort of left that around. So that's <laughs> I haven't listened to this in about five years. <laughs> but drum machines, OK, even, even people like me make drum machines sometimes. Okay, so there's that. Um, um, another example of something is do the switched on Bach, by which I mean um, go find some nice two part invention on the web somewhere, uh, figure out how to get PD to play it. That might be the hard part. Uh, what I did, I had to do this once because someone put me up to learning a piece of classical music, and I don't read music, so I went and found one on the web so that I could learn it by ear. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can do this. Uh, here, oh yeah, here is, um, you'll see this in more detail when I start showing you how to sequence again. Um, here's a nice sequence. This is a text file that contains times, pitches, and I forget, oh, cumulative times. And you can make these files, they, you can get them on the web. They, um, various sites and they're in various formats and I and then you can teach PD how to read them so I made I made a little let's see where is it in fact I made a little polyphonic synth that could play that sequence and this is this really sounds horrible this will make you feel good because yours is going to sound better than this almost no matter what you do well, especially since it doesn't do anything well, let's get a re preset ah there it is from the 1500s that I just had to know for some really weird, stupid reason that I can't explain to you. <laughs> I think weird things happen when you work in music departments. <laughs> All right, so, um, so this is the switched on Bach style uh, project example where you just you know go make something that sounds like Walter Carlos, except of course it doesn't sound like Walter Carlos because no matter how hard you try, you will not be able to sound like Walter Carlos. Right. 
and and you can indeed the, the, the very best things to grab are those two part inventions because they're easy to make sound good. Um, those two part inventions meaning the ones by Bach. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's that. So those were just examples that I had to have of, of times that I had to do these things just to show you to, that these are real projects that you might actually profit from being able to do, at least if you're in my line of work. But, so that was the um, make a patch that plays a blah, 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 blah. Um, make a, here's, an, here's a cool one that will make you impress your friends. Um, make a nice little laptop instrument that you can take to a bar and get people to dance to. Um, laptop instruments... I think are things where um, where the things that you see when you go to entertainment venues where someone is staring into a laptop and you see, and they see the screen you don't or if you do you see a whole bunch of nonsense that's that's their screen that means nothing. Um, the the basic deal is that you have something where you can mouse and, and, and keyboard away and that changes something that typically is, is based on a loop that's modified by parameters that you set by moving sliders up and down or, or whatever it might be. That's a good thing to do. Um, and that could be based on sampling or, or, or whatever. Yeah, I didn't put up this, the following idea because I haven't thought it through well enough to know whether it's a good project idea or not. But make a mashup. Find two pieces of music that are in compatible tempos and keys and make a looping patch that allows you to superimpose them and, and change them around. That could be a good thing. But I don't know how to make that sound good. So. And I'm not sure if you do it, it will sound good. So I'm not sure that's a really good suggestion. Um, you don't know how to do this because I'm not going to tell you. Uh, Tom might. Uh, go uh, do, Think of something that you weren't able to do in PD, whatever it might be, and write a C object to do it, and maybe that be a new PD object. Um, I won't go into that except to say that there are thousands of these running around. They're not hard to do. And if you want to see some of them, they are all over the PD source code. And also, there are hundreds of examples plus websites that tell you how to do this on the web. But don't do this unless you know how to code C pretty well. Because otherwise, you will have to learn how to code C, which you cannot really do in four weeks. Uh, and make a melodyne. This is, this is fun. Um, it is not easy to do because to, well, the hardness is not because it's inherently hard to do, it's actually stupidly easy, but you have to have a pitch shifter handy, and I haven't told you how to make a pitch shifter. And you also have to figure out what the pitch is of the thing that's going in so that you can figure out how, you, how much you have to correct it. And then you have to figure out, and you have to make an algorithm that, given any pitch, figures out what the nearest pitch is that it could have been supposed to be. Right. So what you do is you say, okay, the, the allowable pitches are on C major scale. The current pitch that I'm getting is, who knows, 110 hertz. Well, that's a real pitch. Sorry, 120 hertz. OK, what's the nearest uh, white key to that? Figure that out, and then make a pitch shift or change the pitch by that amount. And then no matter, and then you can talk into it, and it will sing, well, sort of sing. It will talk back at you in the C major scale. And then you'll have a melodyne, and you can sell it. <laughs> Actually, probably not, because I think there are probably hundreds of them on the web now. Uh, Melodyne, by the way, is a uh, trade name, but they, people use it as generic or just to mean something that whacks your pitch into something that sounds melodic. And then you can go from there. Uh, you can go wild from there because you can add a keyboard and make it allow you to play little, tri or whatever, play ornaments on things or whatnot. There's all sorts of good stuff you can do once you have this. But the two things I haven't told you are how to find out what the pitch of a sound is and and then how to change the pitch of the sound. Both of those are techniques that, that I will try to squeeze into the rest of the quarter, but I don't know if I will be able to. Yeah, and think of something else. Uh, oh, you know what, something else. Go buy one of those Arduino um, hoo-hahs and make a little physical device that has buttons or, or, or knobs on it that allows you to give yourself a physical synthesizer control interface. But. Oh, they're called, um, the usual one is called Arduino. You go to, well, what I do is I go to sparkfun.com and you can buy processors for like, oh, it depends, but 20 ish dollars. And then you can build little circuits out of them that, that are anything that you want. You can make robots or, or sensor arrays or whatnot. Um, 
And that really should be the subject of the course, but if, and also you shouldn't do that unless you are able to deal with voltages and solder and things like that. So don't try that unless you think you know what it entails. Yeah, anyway, but that would be another thing that would be perfectly cool. But I predict that most of you are going to want to make a drum machine or an interactive playable laptop instrument or something like that, and that's just cool. Because actually, 30 different drum machines are going to have 30 different uh, personalities. It'll be fine. OK, uh, questions about all this? This is, this is all up on the web now. This all, well, what, what this is so far is up on the web. And if you have questions about it, ask me. And probably that means I should put something else up that says something more about what's going on. <laughs> All right, so that's the final project. It's a presentation. Um, we're now still doing modulation continued wave shaping as well. Wave shaping and not wave packets yet, although I might get into that today depending on timing. Because what I want to do is make sure that everyone is on the same page just about the wave shaping thing first, and then we'll proceed from there, time permitting. Uh, the other sort of organizational thing that I'm uh, that I'm succeeding in not forgetting the time to say is the following. Um, I'm on, I have two trips coming up, and there will be, subs, there will be a substitute teacher um, the next two Tuesdays, Cooper Baker, who is a graduate student who's also an expert uh, PD programmer and other, and computer musician and circuit builder and many other things, uh, who has a lot of good things to, to say and show, will talk, I believe, next Tuesday about frequency modulation, assuming the syllabus works. And then, depending on how it all works, we'll be talking about delays uh, a Tuesday after that. And I will try to make a dovetail with the syllabus as closely as I can. I'm not sure yet what, um, how that's going to work with the taping scheme. Um, also, taping, uh, all these classes are taped, thanks to Joe, and you can get them. So don't forget if you need to get if you need to review, that's one possible way of doing it, which might be useful. OK. Um, right. Questions about all that before I just jump in and patch away? Or things I forgot to say? Yeah. OK. So, uh, so now, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I showed you, all, uh, I showed you a, a sort of a mathematical way of thinking about all this stuff last time, but this time, I propose simply to go straight in and deal with it at the level of patch because just on the theory that if you change your teaching style every week, it either makes everything totally coherent or else it makes everything totally incoherent, depending on your point of view. Okay, so so this is this is uh, this is where we got at the end of the last class. Where um, let's see, I'm going to give us 110 hertz, which is a low A, and then we were taking that signal and um, at, uh, messing with its amplitude and then reading the cosine of it, and that was giving us this kind of signal. Let's see. What I'm going to do is give us both channels. Don't know why. And then turn this on, and then turn this on. Yes. And so, whoops, get a little clicking. Okay, so in goes sinusoid outcome signal like that, and the good thing about the signal is that it changes timbre when you change the amplitude, right? Okay, now what's happening here? Well, there are two things happening here that, that I mentioned last time. One is, yeah, uh, nonlinear things like cosine don't react to doubling the input by doubling the output. They react to doubling the input by changing the output, and that's best, or maybe most easily described as a changing waveform. Um, let's see. The other thing I wanted to do was um, graph this so that you can see some sort of representation of what this is. Whoa. Oh, yeah. I'm listening to that and I'm graphing that. Okay. There it is. Okay. So this is now the. This, is, this might remind you of what happened when I used the exponential lookup function last time, which is if you give it an index of nothing, you don't hear anything because we're multiplying this by 0. This adder is adding 0, too. I haven't got there yet. And now we're taking the cosine of 0, which is 1, and so the thing is just sitting at the top of the table being constant 1. And then as we push this up, oops, where's the button? We start getting sound, and the thing 
starts acting like a pulse train, except it's not, because instead of reading an exponential, we're reading a cosine, so that after a certain point, oh, so this is the most pulse trainy it looks, but, but notice it doesn't just sort of act, sit at zero here, it starts doing the next thing, which is rising again. So now the waveform that we've got is we're, we're making a, a sinusoid and we're reading the cosine wave, but we're reading not only the first lobe of it, if you like, which is to say it goes from minus one up to one, that's at zero, and then back down to minus one, but we're making it go a little bit past that amplitude a half thing. And therefore, it's giving us the next wiggle, if you like. So the, oh, I should put this on a metronome so you can see it. Well, maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, I will. Okay. Put that up here. Let's not do it too crazily fast. And now I need a nice toggle. So, by the way, the, the reason this is changing, of course, is because the cosine is at a different phase each time the metronome goes off. Meanwhile, as I change the amplitude of the cosine, the waveform changes because it's reading more and more cycles of the cosine wave it's looking up in. Actually, I should turn the frequency down so you can see it more clearly. So now we have nothing turning into something looking kind of sinusoidal knot and then turning into progressively higher and higher frequencies. And you can almost tell just by looking at this that this should have high frequencies in it. Although, I don't know a simple theorem that says that the more a thing wiggles up and down, the higher a the, the more high frequencies it has. Even, the, even so, it's clearly true that if you make something like this, it's going to have some high frequencies that it didn't have when it looked more like this. Whoops, what did I do wrong? I didn't hit the return. Like that. All right, so that's the, that's the amplitude to timbre change. The good thing about the cosine as a wave, as a wave shaping thing is that no matter what you do to this index, it gives you out roughly the same power. So even if you ask it to make some ridiculous uh, index, all right? How about ten thousand? All right. Well, okay. But you can tell that it was basic. Uh, I mean, it ranges from zero to one. Uh, sorry, from minus one to one, and it, you know, the power of that thing is going to be roughly the same as the power of the original cosine wave. Okay. That's a good thing for building computer music instruments because it means that um, it means that you can put it into your amplifier and expect decent results to come out. The, uh, the previous example, which was the exponential, sort of did that except that, actually let me get it out and show it to you, except I will Let's see, I'm going to save this and close it because I haven't changed the name of the table. Uh, I'll change the name of the table. This is uh, 17. Alright, did that. Now we can actually open the other one and they won't fight. 15, wave shaping, there it was, okay. This one now, oh, wrong, where did I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking in the wrong place. Where I wanted to look was in the help. Here's where we were. We were doing this, and then we were looking at E, exponential, sorry, this is the real one. Okay, and now we have this situation where we can listen to the sound. Let's, oh yeah, give it an index. And now it makes 
waveforms like this, but the trick is here, if you start giving it extreme values here, which I didn't allow you to type because I didn't want to reveal this right away, 2000, oops. At some point, you're going to notice that this thing doesn't have a whole lot of power and it's going to start fading out, <coughs> so 20,000. Now we just have, well, it's getting quieter. So this is not terribly well behaved from the point of view of the power of the signal, although it's not so bad psychoacoustically for the usual reasons. Okay, this the using the cosine is much more gentle to your uh, audio hardware because it pretty much gives you the same signal power no matter what you what you do to it, except for extreme situations like almost zero. Okay, and the next thing about this is this. Um, See, let's go back down to something reasonable. And let's listen to it. So we also have a we can also ask for the cosine or for sine by moving by 25% down the waveform. And then we have this change. And then we have this stuff in between, which is changing the even and odd harmonics. even be a useful thing to listen to. Okay, so that was, that's exploiting the fact that the cosine is even, the sine is odd, and if you just graph a cosine and then start changing the place that you look at, just moving the origin, you can move continuously between being an even and an odd function. That's a good thing. And that's a, that's a property that, huh, that's a property that the exponential wouldn't have had. Alright. Um, as a sort of sneak preview. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so sneak preview, this will last about five minutes. How to, how to think about frequency modulation in these same terms. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is do a save here, or save as, because I will have to ruin my patch. So what I'll do is I'll make two exactly equivalent frequency modulation patches, one the correct way to do it and the other the way that allows you to actually think about what it is and what it does. Right? So frequency modulation is this. First I'll do the, the classical one. Um, give yourself an oscillator. Oh, actually, let's do the whole thing. We'll Let's see, I'm going to get rid of this. This is now an amplitude controlled oscillator here. So I'm going to make myself a copy of that. And then, let's see, does this work? I'll give it a frequency, I'll give it an amplitude, and then an amplitude sound, okay? Now, next idea is what if we took this and Took another one and use this one to control the or to mess with the phase of the other one. So how would you do that? So we need another oscillator whose phase we can mess with. So we can't actually do that by just doing the simplest form oscillator with OSC tilde. We have to split that into cosine and phase. So we'll do that. So now this one is going to be an oscillator, all right, but it's going to Oh dear, how am I going to put this? I really need to put it on the other side. Okay, this one I'm going to leave alone, and this one I'm going to make the make be the cosine and the, the phaser and the cosine separate. So there's a cosine, and then we're going to say phaser. All right, and this now is just another oscillator. Except we can't hear it right. Still can't hear it. Why not? I've done something wrong. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to do is take this oscillator and use it to mess up the phase of this oscillator by adding it to the phase, which I'll do just actually, yeah. 
I should put a plus tilde to be explicit about it, but I'm going to be lazy and not do that. And now I'm going to move this up here so we can see what's going on. Shift. Oh, wrong button. well as I'm going to be able to make it, right? Okay, so now we'll listen to this one. And now this one, to start with, I'm just going to make it run at 6 hertz, and I'm going to do that to it. So now what we have is 100, oh, let's make this higher. So now what we're doing, this is, this is not what I showed you uh, in the first couple of weeks of class, where I showed you, oh, here's an oscillator, and here's another oscillator changing the frequency of that one. Here, Instead, I've taken this oscillator and split it up into a phaser and a cosine so that I can add this other oscillator, not to the frequency, but to the phase. Why? Because that's the way people do it. You know, there are two reasons to do this. Well, three. Yeah? Um, could, you, could you just accomplish the same thing by adding it into the second and the other? No, because the second inlet of the oscillator is, is, takes messages to set the phase, but then the phase starts taking off from there. And so the signal itself doesn't add in as a, yeah, right. It won't take a signal for offsetting the phase. So you have to explicitly do it this way. Okay, so why didn't you just have an oscillator here instead of separating it and then just change the frequency? The original reason, I think, was uh, because this was once uh, implemented in fixed point hardware. And it turns out that if you put the thing up here, you have to do it in units of frequency. So you have to have the values be in hundreds or thousands. And that wasn't a good kind of amplitude to give this oscillator if you were working in hardware whose maximum amplitude might be one. So people figured out that um, by changing the phase directly instead of by changing the frequency, you got to divide, you got to give this thing a much, much smaller amplitude for the same amount of modulation. Right. So this is almost equivalent to putting it in here, except that it, um, except that you have to give it much smaller amplitudes. Here, I'm, I have it, I have an amplitude of 10, and it's already giving me plenty of modulation. Much more so than if I had taken that and put it here. Oh, well, I won't do that now. Anyway. And and again, the more you give it, the deeper it gets. And then if I change this oscillator to a uh, to an audible frequency, then we get this kind of stuff. And this is what people sell you when they sell you a frequency modulation instrument. Although um, to be completely pedantic about it, this is a phase modulation instrument. Um, the, another reason for doing phase modulation instead of frequency modulation is it's better behaved if you are not using sinusoids but other waveforms, or if you are using more than one modulator or more than one carrier. So, oh, I haven't, in other words, if you're making more than just two oscillators, if you're making a more complicated network with five or six oscillators talking to each other, for various technical reasons, it's better to operate on phase than on frequency as well. All right, so this is so this is the incorrectly called frequency modulator, which is a fa phase modulation instrument. And um, I think this is mostly what Cooper will talk to you about next Tuesday, but by choosing, by smartly choosing these two frequencies and this so-called index of modulation, you can make all these wonderful sounds. And you're not limited only to two of these. You can make comp you can you can make them with bunches more and then you can be smart about how you design the sound. And there are there's a book about that that came out in the seventies, I think eighties. So you can find out lots of stuff about just frequency modulation. Um, it's the sorry, not to go too far down that route. Why am I talking about this now? Because this is equivalent to one of these. So you can think about that by thinking about wave shaping, if you're careful. 
So the careful way of thinking about this as wave shaping is the following. This is the cosine of the sum of two signals. One is a phasor and the other is a sinusoid, okay? But the cosine of the sum of two things is equal to, you get the usual formula, cosine A plus B is cosine A cosine B minus sine A sine B. So we could rewrite this network, and I'll only, I'll only do the cosine half, I won't do the sine half, just to save sanity. Okay, and I, have, I need a new window anyway. So make new window. Oh wait, you know what? This is a new window. I can just erase this, right? So another way of thinking about this is uh, this will take the cosine of this and we'll take the cosine of that and we'll multiply them. So what that means is we've already got the thing that, no, let's get rid of this because we don't need any more. So here's taking the cosine of the oscillator. That's taking the cosine of this side. Now we'll take the cosine of the phaser. That's just one of these. And then we'll multiply. So I'll cut these off and then I'll just say times. Tilde. And here, of course, there's another simplification we can make. Phaser and cosine, now we're not sticking anything extra here, so this actually could just be an oscillator now. So this is equivalent to, I'll leave this, oh, yeah, I can do it. This is equivalent to just saying OSC tilde. And now look what we've got. We've got exactly that, fa that wave shaping instrument that I told you before, or told you about before, which is take an oscillator and change its amplitude and take the cosine of it, and then multiply that by this oscillator, and you've seen that before, that's ring modulation. So frequency modulation is equivalent to two networks like this, because the other one would have to use sine instead of cosine. But basically, it's a, an oscillator, take the cosine, that does this, and then multiply it by some other cosine, and then you get these sounds. And those sounds are pretty much the same kind of sounds as these sounds. Although I'm being, I'm pulling a fast one on you because I'm not really checking that they're exactly the same. But morally speaking, that's about the same deal, right? Okay, so frequency modulation you can understand by understanding wave shaping and ring modulation. And Again, the word modulation just means change, and computer musicians use it to mean all sorts of things. So ring mo don't, don't consider ring modulation and frequency modulation as being any, in any way related, except for the fact that they both use the word modulation for artificial reasons. Okay. Ring modulation is this multiplication thing. Ring modulation is linear, but it's not time invariant, and so it is able to make new frequencies out of old frequencies that weren't there. That will get explained in more detail later, I think. And then this is the running this oscillator with an amplitude control through a nonlinear function. And this amplitude control corresponds exactly to this thing, which is called the index of modulation over in this thing, which is where we're doing phase modulation. So now modulation means ring, frequency, phase, and then something else. Well, yeah, that's good enough. Questions about this? This net. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Except they have six so called operators instead of two. I don't know why they call them operators, they're just oscillators. Right? So. So you, yeah, and you get to make various networks of the six. There's some circuitry that allows you to figure out signals. But yeah, basically this is this is what's happening inside of DX7. For those of you who know what a DX7 is, they came out in '84, maybe. Yeah. Now it's called a cell phone. Okay. So this, is, so this is the relationship between wave shaping and, and frequency modulation. However, it's a special case of wave shaping because it's this cosine function here. If you threw any other function in besides cosine, you would no longer have this, uh, this identity that um, the sum of it uh, means multiplying two, 
true of them. In other words, this trigonometric identity would work out differently if it were not cosine, but some other function, and then this wouldn't work. So wave shaping in some sense, or this kind of wave shaping followed by modulation is a much more general way of doing things in some respects than frequency modulation is. In fact, yeah, in fact, I guess this is the moment to say this. Um, what would happen if you just made this thing be exponential instead? So that, what that means is we go back to our patch. I threw it out. Okay, so I'm going to save this. Now what I'm going to do is go back and get help and get that exponential patch again, the exponential uh, wave shaping patch, and do the same thing to it to see what we get. That was, whoops, sorry, back here. I, I'm, I don't want to build it because I don't want to go through the hassle of making this function. Oh, which, and by the way, I'm being stupid because I could just use exp tilde, couldn't I? Why don't I, okay, let, let me be smart now. I'm going to get rid of this, even though this, oh, wait, I want, I want all this graphing stuff. I'm going to keep this, okay, because I want to graph this for you. So we're going to save this as, now we're going to go back where we were. This will be three. All right, so now what I'm going to do, okay, so reminder, what this patch does is this kind of sound, whoops, sorry, and this kind of waveform. So there's the waveform up there. Oh, man, it hates me because I've got too much stuff on the screen. Yeah, there's the waveform for you, and here's the spectrum. And to make this, to make it clear what's going to happen next, I'm going to try to move this over so that you can see the whole spectrum pretty much. All right. Now what I propose to do is take this. Oh, by the way, the reason you're hearing these skips in the sound is because it's using CPU time to graph these tables, which is making my little machine hate itself. Um, if you want to have tables that are changing while you're computing stuff, put the tables in a sub-window and close it so that your machine doesn't have to graph it and then you won't get these skips. But I'm being pedagogical, so I'm leaving everything out here on, on the main page where everyone can see it. Okay, so now, um, I did the table lookup. Now I'm going to operate exactly as before, which is to say I'm going to multiply this by a nice sinusoid. So what that means is we'll say times and then we'll go, oh, I made one in, well, get this one. Here's an oscillator. Here's an amplitude thing. Oh, but I don't want, I don't want, I don't need this. I just need a number. And this is no longer index. This is now a ring modulator. Oscillator times, now we look at it and listen to it. So nothing, nothing's different yet, but if I start changing this, now I get classic ring modulation, oh crap, well, it's just going to be what it is. So each one of these peaks is split into two peaks, because that's what ring modulation does to a spectrum. This is the spectrum and this is the waveform. And, and we're multiplying rather slowly, and this thing is not really showing the waveform as it's changing because it's really going up and down every, well, 15 times a second. But if I make this higher, then eventually you'll start seeing Oh, drat. I want that thing to be limited. which I tune just by ear to be the second harmonic of the, of the pulse train. And now if I start pushing the index up, I get a, a hat-shaped function which is 
centered around this frequency. And in fact, I could make that whatever I want. I could slide this thing anywhere I want and have this sort of hat-shaped spectrum moved to whatever location I want it. Right? So now this is controlling bandwidth. And this is controlling center frequency of the spectrum. Okay. Bandwidth is a term <coughs> that you will hear a lot in computer music. It just means the width of the band. But the but bands in this case are are ranges of frequencies. Um, that I think is radio terminology originally, uh, like the FM band. So in this case, what we're talking about is a band of frequencies like that. Um, why would that be a band? Oh, yeah, never mind. And the center of the band is being controlled by this ring modulating oscillator. This is what happens in DC. So if, if I send the oscillator to frequency zero, the biggest peak is, is at DC. Right? And this peak then got aliased out somewhere here, and then these peaks got aliased out to DC plus and minus those frequencies. Or to put it another way, there are negative frequencies in this thing that I'm not graphing, and when we multiply it by a sinusoid, which then moves it over, it actually moves it over like that, uh, then we see the negative frequencies as well as the positive ones showing up, which is this. Oh, you don't see any negative frequencies until this one bounces off. There's the sound. Okay. Now, these are perfectly nice harmonic sounds as long as I choose these things just right, like that number I found. Um, in other words, if this thing, okay, so this is going to put out a pitch, which is controlled by this fundamental. What would happen if? Yeah, it's not. I don't know when this fundamental is being computed, so I can't use it. This fundamental must be something about half this, like 170 something. But I think it was computed using load bang, so I don't think if I use it now, it's going to give me a new value. Okay. Um, what else can I say about this? What does it look like in the time domain? So here, I guess what I should do is let, let me let me stop modulating it. Okay, so there's our nice pulse train, and I'll, I'll skinny it up so that the pulse is decently small like that. And then when I start multiplying it by an oscillator, uh, just to see what happens, I'll give it a very high frequency here. Ten, uh, no, 5,000. And now what we see is that there is a, well, it's a pulse train. It's a, um, every time the, every time this thing makes a pulse, which it does every cycle, you get a pulse times this oscillator, and I asked that oscillator to go very, very fast so you could see it, but what, what's happening here is just a bunch of pulses one after the other. And now the uh, center frequency is way off the screen here, so you can't see the spectrum anymore. But you can sort of guess what this thing should sound like. It, it's, its period should be from here to here. That's the smallest interval at which you can see repetition. And so that period is being controlled by this fundamental frequency, as long as this was actually a multiple of it, which it's not, so I'm pulling a slight fast one here. Um, and meanwhile, the, if you think about what frequencies are present in this as a, as a signal, they're mostly high. They're mostly these frequencies here. And that agrees with the general observation about ring modulation, which is if you ring modulate by a very high frequency, it takes whatever you got and, and slides it to where you sort of see it as a clump of frequencies around the ring modulating frequency. So another observation about this is that, any questions about this? Is everybody completely confused now? There's nothing complicated about this patch, but the, comp the complexity is all in, what it, in how you analyze what it does. And that's typical, unfortunately, of electronic music, that just putting three or four modules together quickly gives you a situation where it takes hours or days to explain what the thing is actually doing. Yes. 
that's just what it is. And unfortunately, you have to go through the explanation because I don't know of any other way to be able to design things um, with some notion of what they're going to be. Yeah. Right. Um, oh, gosh. If you really want to. <laughs> Sounds like something that out of uh, Poem Electronique. <laughs> and most of these are in harmonic, but every once in a while I'll hit a multiple of this and you get a harmonic sound, but you can't even really tell the difference because at that point, well, there's the, there are theories of perception that say, I, I don't know if they're true, that basically the first ten harmonics are the things that your ears will use to try to determine the pitch of the thing, and after that, your ear hears the fact that there's energy there, but won't actually use the pitches of those harmonics to tell you what the pitch of the original sound is. So here, <laughs> don't do this, but I could take this thing and add it to the modulated sound, and now you hear a nice sound with a fundamental and some nice high harmonics. And those high harmonics, they don't have anything to do with that sound. They're just whatever frequencies they are, but your ear can't tell that. So it just accepts it. <laughs> All right. Don't tell anyone I told you that. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, it's not as useful a fact to know as all that, because um, in fact, what you would really like to be able to do is, is make things that uh, can change controllably between stuff that has low frequencies in it and not. And of course, as soon as I change this thing so that some low frequencies come in, you're going to hear the fact that they're mistuned, and then you're going to not, well, you're not going to believe that that's a harmonic tone anymore. So you would have to work harder if you wanted to make a general instrument that would allow you to do this kind of thing. And I want to show you how to do that, but maybe not right now, because uh, why? Because there are two ways of doing it, and they're equally important, and I don't know how to fit both of them in one half of the class. So what I want to do is show you things that will be useful for doing final projects. Um, because, okay, so there's stuff that doesn't fit in the syllabus, which is just lore about how to use PD. And so what I want to do now for the rest of this class is show you PD lore that is of use for just building stuff. The, the most important thing that I haven't told you how to do yet is sequencing. And if you can, well, I've told you how to do two kinds of sequences, which is basic, both of which are table-based. And the thing that you do is you make a counter and you make the counter count through the table. It could either be a phaser reading a table as a signal or it could be a metronome driving something at increments. And that's a, that's a way of making a 1960s kind of sequencer. Um, and it's appropriate for driving monophonic synthesizers. And then for polyphonic stuff, okay, there's a certain place you can go with it, but it's not going to like do general polyphonic sequencing for you. So how, do you, how would you make something that actually is capable of polyphonic sequencing? There, there are many ways, but I'll just show you one that, that is the most, the second most general, the third most general. Something that's about the right level of complexity to get most people's needs, but without having to, to spend hours and days learning how to do it. Okay, so here it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new window and Give it a name. It's going to be four sequencer. So the object that does sequencing, the, the oh wait, wrong button. The object that does sequencing in, in the most general, in the most general form that I want to deal with right now, is called Q list. Um, this is probably a misuse of of the word Q list. Uh, let's make it have a decent file. But we can call it that anyway. What a queue list is is a bunch of messages in, in PD language that can have... Um, oh, I have to tell you some things I haven't told you. This is good. Okay. First off, message boxes. Yeah, message boxes and receives. Okay, so I've shown you this so far. I've shown you how to do send uh, <coughs> name one send name to and then we'll have receives oh S and R are, are short for send and receive and now I'm just going to put numbers here 
so that you can see that this is a way of making a non-local connection. All right. So my reason for showing you this is so that I can now show you the following very strange thing. Let's get a message. Uh, first off, let's make it just have a number in it and do this. Oh, wait. That's the same number. OK, that's all good. Uh, in fact, I showed you another thing, which is that you can have commas. And here, if you do that, you will send those three messages, and you'll just see the last value, even though the number box actually attained all three of those values, all in a zero period of time. OK. There are, you've seen one other syntactic element of, of message boxes, which is the dollar sign. That's the thing that allows you to have an incoming number that, uh, that changes the message. There's one other syntactic thing available for message boxes, and that is that you can have messages separated by semicolons. And by convention, I put a, a carriage return in here. So now if we do this, what we're doing is we're saying the message is 56, and then there's another message which is 67, but that message is going to be sent to the receipt or to the object named name two, or the objects named name two, all of them, if there are more than one. So comma means begin a new message. Semicolon means begin a new message, and by the way, that message is not going to go to this, it's not going to go to this outlet at all, it's going to go to this other object. Yeah. So if you didn't have a name two there, would it go to the name one? No, it would go to it would go try to find an object named sixty seven and that's not a legal name for an object because it's a number. And so then I should see an error message. I hope I get an error message. Oh it just says float no such object. oh that's horrible. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So there's no such object sixty seven. It's not willing to do that. Okay. So so you have to give it a the name of a destination, which could indeed or okay, so next thing. We don't really even have to use this first one. We could just say, nah, no message at all, thanks. But name one gets a message 67, and name two gets a message 34. And then when we whack that, those two messages go out. Now, now this is starting to look useful, I hope. Now we can do this kind of stuff. So it's almost a preset mechanism. Not quite. Yeah. Yeah, you have to have the semicolon because otherwise there will be a message name one one twenty three and that will come out this outlet. So the first semicolon means the name of a, of a receiver follows and the receiver is this. So this is really a strange, ugly syntax. Um, but it's what it is. It's consistent. It's, it's logical, even though it looks weird. Okay, now, I showed you that so I could show you this. This is cool, and this, this will allow you to, to have any number of parameters in a patch, right? So I could now make an FM instrument and give the carrier frequency, well, I'm using names I haven't to describe it. You know, the frequency of the two oscillators, those could have names, and then the index of modulation could have a name. The amplitude could have a name. I could make it six operator, and I could have, I don't know, 12 names, and that would all be cool, right? And then I could put them all in this one message box and just whack the message box once, and all those values would go off to all the right things. Probably should have told you this before. <laughs> this becomes, you know, this, this becomes almost uh, inescapably important as soon as your patch reaches a certain level of, of complexity. While we're, yeah. While we're here, it's always good when you have a patch more than a certain amount of complexity to have a button which is just reset. So you probably have already had the experience of starting a patch up and not having it do the thing that it was doing when you last closed it. Um, this is your friend for being able to get things to go back to states that you know about, and. 
it's worthwhile. It's it's often worthwhile having one of these things hooked up to a load bang so that every time your patch opens up, the values are as you wish them to be when the patch loads up. All right. So this is not computer music knowledge. This is just PD lore. And when you change to some other programming language, this would be different. Now, about QList. Okay, so this allows you to do everything that you could possibly want except for sequencing. And now if you wanted to do sequencing with this, I could tell you how to do it using delays. Well, you already know. You just make a whole bunch of message boxes separated by delays. Yeah, and in fact, let me show you the first ever Max patch, which I've imported into PD, which does exactly that. This is, I'm just doing this to horrify you. Um, so we're going to go back to here, we're going to get uh, repertory, because this is going to be music. We're going to go look at Pluton. This is on the web, by the way. If you go download the PD repertory project, you can look at all these scary patches. Uh, this is going to be Menory Pluton, and then we're going to have a patch called Pluton.pd. This is a 45 minute long piece of music, right? maybe 48. And here's section, I'll get one at random, here's section 31. It has a Q, which is a number, and then it has some sub patches. And this sub patch has events number 1, 2, 3, and 4 in it. So we'll get an inlet and we'll select one, two, three, and four, and each one of them is going to have message boxes sending parameters to values. You can make sequences like this. You will tear your hair out after a certain amount of time keeping track of when you changed what, uh, because obviously this could lead to horrible messes. And, and by the way, if you go looking in the right place, this, this is not a good example, but if I find a good example, you'll find delays in here. Uh, nope, nope. Six, okay, 21, here we go. Ooh, bad, 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 bad. Wrong section, two. Yeah, here we go. So why don't we, on event five, do all this good stuff, but then after a delay of five seconds, we'll start at the other sequence, or whatever that is. Okay, so now we have the ability to Wait until event number five comes in. No, never mind who's figuring out what, what queue we're on. But you can think there might be a queue number five, so there's an increment or somewhere in there. And event number five means do this. I shouldn't do that. And then after five seconds, do this. But what if someone did event number six before those five seconds had elapsed? Then you would have event five, and then part of event six, and then part of event five happen. And what if this thing started something that this thing was supposed to stop? Then instead of starting and stopping, it would stop and start, and then you would have the thing playing for the rest of the piece, which you didn't want, right? So you had better check, you'd better stop this delay when the next puppy comes in, or else it's going to go off. And then, of course, well, and then it gets worse. Okay, so this is, this is making sequencers using message boxes. You can do it, but hmm, not pleasant. Also, you will not be able to download a text file from the internet and then have it be that, right? Okay, so that was, uh, so that was Pluton. I'm not going to show you more about that just now. So there's a better way, which is to make a queue list. Uh, a queue list is a text, or is read from a text file, I should say. And the text file has a bunch of messages in it that are separated by numbers that, uh, that are event numbers. <coughs> or actually that are times, I should say. So, so QList acts like this. First off, you have to be able to read files in. So I'm going to make a message box that says read sequence one. And I'm going to give it an extent.txt because on some kinds of machines, if your file isn't named something.txt, it doesn't know it's a text file. And now I'm going to make a text file named sequence1. Um, you all have Macintoshes, and you will get out the text editor, and it will not make a text file by default. It will make a rich text file. You've got to make a real text file. Um, and there's some, there's some thing in the text editor on the Mac that lets you do this, but uh, I've forgotten what it is, and it takes some finding. Okay, I don't need this anymore. And this thing is just an orphan, so let's get rid of it. 
Okay, now what, we're in, what I'm going to do is make a nice file. Okay, are we in the right directory? Yes. Um, don't watch me do... Oh, it's okay. I'll do this. Uh, net it. Okay, text editor, right? And now I'm going to say message one. Okay, so name one, 45, name two, 67, and then let's wait a second, and then let's do name one back to zero just to make it look like it's turning off. Okay. Oops, I don't want that space there. And notice I'm putting semicolons after every line because semicolon is the delimiter here. Just like in message boxes. And if you forget, then it will not do the right thing for you. Did I say sequence or sequence one? I wonder. I probably said sequence one. Okay. And then let's go back and get the patch. I've got all this junk open that I don't want. Wanted, yeah, of course I wanted to save it. Yeah, now we say read, and meanwhile, let's just check. Make sure we didn't get any errors. We didn't get any errors, good. Uh, and of course, if I had said the wrong thing here, then I would get some horrible... Wait, come here. Then it would say, no such file. Yeah, right, okay. So this is good. We believe that this is working right. Okay, now what is the Q now what what can we do? Well we can just say bang. And then it says boing boing. Right? And there's a sequence. So do it again. <laughs> Idiot's delight now. Okay, so name one and name two are the receives. And now we hit the queue list and there's the first message and there's the second, and those are the two messages or the two pairs of messages I put in this file. Where is the file now? Ah, I think I must have closed it. There. So that is the easiest way to sequence stuff in PD. And you can combine this with, oh, these can be any kinds of messages that you want. So you can combine this with line, tilde, objects to do things that, that, um, that ramp or whatnot, right? I mean, this, anything that you can do with messages. You can connect <coughs> things that have messages with, with bunches of arguments and then use unpack to get them out. Um, yeah. Which one would do a lot of, actually, when, when you really are doing this. Um, yeah, what else should I say about this? Uh, other messages Q list takes. I don't know if, well, just, oh, go away. Print's a good message. Uh, when you tell the thing to print itself, out on the PD window comes everything that the thing has. Sorry about the backslashes. That's a good way of checking whether the thing is what you want it to do. And finally, and now we are going to be living dangerously. If you want to make a nice loop out of this, you could do something like this. Let's go back to the, oh, where's the text file again? Here. Let's, let's say, oh, we want to do this and then, and then we want it to loop. So I'm going to say after another Second, by the way, I could either have a semicolon or not here for technical reasons, but I'm going to put it just to be simple. And then I'm going to say restart, bang, and semicolon just to be complete. And now here I can say, oh, this is not a really good idea, is it? How am I going to ever be able to stop this? There is, actually. Yeah, so that'll work. Okay, so we'll do this. So stop. Let's just check that. So I should be able to say, bing, bing. And then the third thing is going to be an error message because there's nobody named um, restart. Oh, I didn't get an error. Oh, I didn't save. You know what? This is the sort of thing that happens. You've got to save this. Then you've got to tell it to read the sequence. And then you can tell it to do this stuff. Bing, bing, and then error. <laughs> there, restart, no such object. 
And now I can say receive restart. And that's just going to bang the cue list, which I'll make it I'll make it flash by hooking it through the button. Uh, I hope this works. Yeah. All right. So now you have another way of making the step sequencer if you wanted to. There's uh, one little thing about this, one more message that, that might, you might like, which is that you can set the tempo, uh, which is, let's see, let's do it this way. Dollar one recall is in a message box. In the message box context, dollar one is just uh, take the value and stick it in the message. So here, if I say one, it's going to be tempo one, which should be the same, the original tempo. And if I double it, it does that for me. And then stop doesn't stop it because it doesn't have a method for stop. Okay. I think it's called rewind, actually. Good. Why is it called rewind? Because there's more that you can do that I'm not telling you about. Uh, you can, if you want to, single step through the messages instead of having it sequenced through them. So to do that, you send it rewind in the next. And then you can control your own timing instead of using QList's own timing. And that would be useful if you wanted to make um, if you wanted to make something that had random variations in the timing or some, or some algorithmic way of controlling timing besides just the numbers in the queue list itself. So given, given the fact that there's this tempo message here, we could set the tempo to 1,000th and then just have this thing be in beats, like one, one beat instead of 1,000 milliseconds, and that would work fine. Although when I'm... Starting out, I just always do it in milliseconds because it's easier to think about that, I think. You don't have to agree with that. So, oh, th since everything else in PD is in milliseconds, it's, it might be easier just to have the units be coherent as opposed to having them be different in the, in the queue list from everywhere else. All right. So that's the queue list object, which is key to making sequences. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is this is a thing that this is a very confusing thing. Okay. So what I, what I'll do is print these out. And give it a couple of tempi like that. And then it makes messages and the messages are what you put in there except that dollar 1 has substituted for it the value of the first argument that went in. So this is the way that you can make messages that vary inside a single message box. And furthermore, if you have a packed message with several numbers in it, they can be addressed as $1, $2, $3, and so on. So you can have multidimensional vari variability. You haven't had to do this much because you haven't seen very many objects which are complicated <coughs> enough that they take a bunch of different messages like this. For the most part, messages are always just numbers because Usually simple objects only do one kind of thing, or at least one kind of thing per inlet. And so numbers suffice as a, as a message passing language. But in an object like QList, it has a bunch of state. Uh, there are a bunch of things that you might wish to ask it to do, like rewind and go to the next thing and change its tempo and so on. And then you need a bunch of different kinds of messages like this. And then you need message boxes that can put together messages that have both words and numbers in them, symbols and numbers. and have them still be variable. So that's, so I've been avoiding doing this for reasons of sanity, but that's there and ready to get used. Other questions about this? Yeah. What are the outlets of the keywords? Oh, yeah. The outlets are useful if you want to make your own sequencer. Um, this one gets a bang whenever QList finishes, if you want to know that. Um, actually, I could have made this loop in a different way by doing that. Um, this one gets, um, doesn't get anything when QList is being used as a sequencer by itself, but if you single step it, if you say next, it goes up to the next number and then outputs the number here. 
so that instead of having it interpret that number as time, you grab the number or numbers and interpret them to be whatever you want them to be. And that's how you would make your own sequencer out of QList that might do something more manual. And there's much, much too much information in the help window for QList that will tell you all this kind of stuff. Um, the, the easy way to get confused with QList is to change the sequence in this text file and then to forget to tell it to reread the new sequence. Also, if you read in a new sequence, I believe it will insist on rewinding itself so it won't be able to continue playing the sequence if you change the sequence while it's playing. Okay, so this is, with, um, with one exception, this is able to do all of your sequencing needs. And the one exception is that um, all of these names are global, name one and name two and so on. If you wanted to have a bunch of instances of a patch, each of which was using a queue list to control different variables that were local or, or depended on the patch, then this then queue list wouldn't suffice to do this. You would have to reach for a lower level tool that allowed you to get those things and, and play with them yourself. And there's ways of doing that. In fact, if you get the queue list help window, it'll send you onto the, the thing called text file, which gives you less automation lets you build more general things yet yet than QList can do for you. Okay. So just to just to sort of review where we're at, because we only have five minutes, it's not enough time to <coughs> go start doing wave packets or whatever it's going to be next. Um, okay, so so next time is going to be frequency modulation in more of a from more of a a how to do it kind of standpoint than a sort of how to make sounds out of it as opposed to simply what the theory is. Um, and that I've tried to fit into this uh, tale about, uh, about wave shaping, which is what uh, the last couple of things have been about, and, and ring modulation. Um, the, where we are in the book is now so, chapter five-ish, chapter six. And Chapter six, I think, is what I'm going to squeeze down to a day or two, and that will be Thursday of next week if it's only one day. And the, the topic there is going to be how to go back and use um, that wave packet idea, or actually how, how, to, how to use that combination of wave shaping and ring modulation in a way that would allow you to change the ring, to be able to move to, to move the energy around from peak to peak without having this problem of, of not having things be harmonic when you're between two multiples of the same frequency. So that's an important thing to be able to do, which, uh, and there are several techniques for doing it, and I think what I want to do is show two of them, although I have to think very carefully about whether that can fit in a reasonable amount of time. So that will be next Thursday. Meanwhile, you see, I think, what you need to be able to see in order to do things that have sequences now. And that's, so that's sort of where we are. And in, in bookland, where that is, is, where's the book? Um, I took you, then I've taken you pretty much all the way through modulation because this thing about frequency and phase modulation is that um, rampage I went on about FM earlier. And then there's, uh, I'm going to, to kind of give short shrift to this next one, designer, as I call it, designer spectra. That's just my own fanciful title. But that's going to be about how to um, how to place um, how to place how to make peaks in the energy spectrum without uh, having or independently of whether the sound that you're making is harmonic or inharmonic, and that's that's what's coming up next. And I've been looking in there trying to make a plan as to how to do it, but I haven't succeeded. Then, um, starting week after next is going to be time shifts and delays, and that's going to be how you make the standard delay effects, but also how you design reverberators, and also how you do delay tricks like pitch shifting and phasing and chorus effects and whatnot. And that will probably take a week, and then it will be at week 10 and it'll be time to look at gym, and that'll probably be the rest of the quarter. <laughs>